Hey everyone, welcome back. In this video, I'm going to feature a new product that I've designed and built. And so this is shallow horn number 1928 using the Fostex FF85WK. Okay, so let's get right into it. So this is a new design in that it's very shallow. And so I'll discuss that as to why I went with a shallow horn. And I'm going to test three different full range drivers, show you the frequency response and test data, and then uh, offer my subjective listening impressions on the uh, one particular driver model that I ended up going with, which is the FF85WK. Okay, so uh, just looking at the throat here, um, you can see here that I've gone to great lengths to try to integrate the driver into the horn with a custom 3D printed adapter that partially covers the surround. We have about a one millimeter gap there to allow the cone to move a little bit. So this particular driver with its magnesium dome dust cap, it provides clean uh, pistonic output up to almost 30 kilohertz. And so we're gonna get clean output from the dust cap. And so we're gonna get wave propagation along the cone to the surround. And so in order to achieve the flattest uh, frequency response, we wanna make sure that we have this transition really looked after, okay? So why a shallow horn? Okay, so this is something that I had started to think about a while ago. And particularly, I had done a project where I had done a three-way cabinet and I had mounted the four inch mid-range kind of in a very shallow type waveguide situation and that was more at the time just to provide physical time alignment with the dome tweeter by recessing that driver back but it had the added benefit of improving the overall clarity uh, and the sound from the mid-range driver became more focused and so I started to think about if this shallow waveguide had provided such a significant improvement to the sound versus just simply flush mounting it to the baffle, then perhaps there was a case for creating a dedicated shallow waveguide horn for a, uh, a, a really reputable full range driver to use as a point source, providing wide bandwidth from uh, potentially 200 hertz up to 20 kilohertz. Okay, so in addition to this kind of experiment that I had done, I do recall having a discussion with Victor Kong uh, from VK Music. And so he had uh, described to me that the AER jazz speaker was the best sounding horn uh, slash waveguide that he had heard uh, for the AER eight inch full range drivers. So that was another discussion that I had recalled. And so it did correlate uh, with my own uh, experience where uh, the, the shallow mounting uh, provided a little bit extra focus and improvement to the overall sound. You can see here that the AER design has a non-concentric design where the throat is slightly offset with the mouth of the horn and so the idea there is just simply to create uh, a varying distance from the center uh, out to the edge so that you don't have a concentration uh, of edge diffraction off the mouth at one particular frequency. So it's just a method of uh, improving any, uh, flattening the frequency response basically by uh, avoiding edge diffraction off the mouth of the horn. So it's a really interesting design, so that's nice. Um, so with this square design, um, we're trying to achieve a similar goal here by uh, creating different distances to the edge of the horn and it also features the ES horn flare curvature which does have the full wraparound where we machine it on the back and we machine the wraparound curve and then we flip the part around on the CNC and we machine the front side and so we've gone to great lengths to kind of ensure that the there's uh, zero diffraction that would color the sound um, and on top of that um, the idea here too is to have a very clean step response uh, within the first five or six milliseconds. And so uh, from Floyd Tool's work uh, on small room acoustics, there's the president's effect that many people know about where the reflections in the room are combined with the direct sound psychoacoustically so that we perceive it as one sound event. So I can show that uh, in a little bit with the step response results, but the idea here is so that um, within the first millisecond, we have a very clean uh, uh, reflection-free sound 
uh, within the first millisecond in the time domain. And so that's something that I might explain a little bit further later on. Okay, so the three contenders here uh, for use in the Shallowhorn 1928. First one is the Fostex FE83 NV. So you can see it here, this is a more recent offering by Fostex. And so it has a little bit of a concerning dip there that's a surround dip, but otherwise it's well behaved beyond that. And so that's why I decided to try this particular driver out is because it does show very clean uh, response and even in the off axis uh, beyond that. So I was hoping that this wouldn't become a problem, but we'll see. So the next driver is the FF85WK, and so there's quite a range of sizes. This has been out for about 15 years. Uh, this particular one, uh, one of the reasons is I decided to go with this. First of all, the published data looks good. Um, it's showing clean um, frequency response right out to almost 30 kilohertz. Um, so the other uh, thing is that uh, Dave from Planet 10 has often remarked that the uh, the smallest version, the 85WK, has excellent sound quality. And so uh, another uh, big factor for deciding to go with this particular driver. I've always wanted to uh, hear this driver. So uh, the third in the lineup is the Alpair 5.3. This is the one that doesn't have the spider. So it's also uh, provides excellent objective test data with no uh, surround dip, you don't see a surround dip in this driver, and then the breakup doesn't appear to occur until about 15 kilohertz. Okay, um, just discussing the rear chamber, you can see it here. So we had to have a rear chamber for our measurements, and that's so that we don't get interference off the from the back wave interfering with our measurements. And so in addition to that, it helps control and damp the woofer and allow a little bit higher output. Um, you can see here it's a pentagon shape with an inverted back panel and this just prevents any standing waves from occurring um, and escaping through the driver itself so uh, I mentioned a throat transition but I want to discuss context so we're attempting to horn load a full range driver so we're not going to get the same results in terms of frequency response smoothness as you would get with horn loading a dome tweeter or um, horn with a compression driver for example so but what we potentially have is a wide bandwidth coherent sound point source from 200 hertz up to 20 kilohertz and so there's significant uh, advantages if this can be pulled off successfully um, as well as the uh, sound stage depth that can come by having a flat phase response and also potential for a very wide sound stage width if we can get the horn slash waveguide to provide an even uh, well-behaved off axis which we're going to look at as well um, so I touched on a little bit on the step response aspect. I'm just going to skip ahead. I'll come back to the, the test data. So you can see here, uh, this is the step response result with the 1928 horn uh, and with the Fostex FF85WK. You can see here we have the initial impulse and then it's perfectly clean right up to seven milliseconds. And so this is an excellent result and it certainly achieves that specific design goal where we're, where we're trying to uh, provide a clean uh, result that's reflection free uh, within that first one millisecond. And so you'll see here in a bit that we certainly uh, uh, pays dividends in the listening impressions as well. Okay, so scrolling back up to my test results here, sorry about that. So the FE83, uh, that's the white one. You can see here uh, it provides a moderate amount of loading and then it has a severe dip. And so the driver never fully recovers from that dip and that the horn isn't coupled to the driver anymore acoustically and so it puts this driver out of contention it's unfortunate that that this is occurring um, but we must move on to the next so mark audio alpair 5.3 you can see here has good loading and then it just sails on pass through the surround uh, mode that we see there and then we have some dips in the in the upper treble okay so that's that result looking at the f F85 Fostex, the gray one. You can see here, same kind of situation, 
as the Mark Audio, it sails on through a bit of a surround dip. Uh, and then we have kind of a similar situation with the, the dips and the response, uh, similar to the, to the Mark Audio. Now, subjectively, just listening to the two drivers, I much preferred the Fostex uh, for its liveliness and uh, overall dynamics. And so I decided to continue uh, with the Fostex for further development. And so you can see here, I flattened the response using DSP. You can see the effect of flattening the response and giving it a balance uh, between the mid and the highs. And then um, we can get our crossover down to about 300 hertz. So now looking at the step, okay, so we got the step response covered. Um, we have the cabinet tuning with the QTC of 0.7. So we have good, uh, good characteristics there. Now uh, the time domain performance, so being a full range driver, this is relatively good. We're probably seeing some cone break up here. Uh, we saw in the frequency response that we are getting, um, oops, sorry. We are getting extension almost out to 30 kilohertz. And so the uh, dust cap that, we, that I mentioned earlier is providing very high treble extension. And so I believe that it is pistonic, but when we look at the time domain, what we're seeing is the cone portion of the driver that, that is uh, starting to break up there. So now if we look at it as a CSD plot, you can see that it's still, uh, in, in relation to full range driver test data, we're still getting a really uh, good result there. So I won't cover harmonic too much other than to say that it's a balanced, distribution of harmonic and that there's no particular area that's peaking or providing a trouble spot. So now use case scenario for this is low to medium listening levels at um, probably a near field situation at between three and uh, three and four meter listening distance. And so you can see here that at the 75 dB test signal, we have 60 dB of dynamic range. And in particular, the lower mid range uh, appears to be very clean. And then we don't have uh, any kind of rise in IMD as we move up into the upper treble. It's a pretty much even keel uh, distribution of the, the, the noise. All right, um, I did measure Gedley distortion, but I won't uh, bore you too much other than to say that I did compare the Gedley metric against two other compression drivers just to see how it fares. And so what we actually have here is if you look at GM, the Gedley metric, uh, between the three drivers that I have tested to date, you can see that the uh, Fostex is significantly lower GM distortion than the uh, two other compression drivers in the test. And so this is showing extremely low GM. Uh, however, the, it's, the results are inverted when we're looking at harmonic. And so the Fostex actually showed very high harmonic distortion compared to the uh, two compression drivers, but showed very low Gedley. So the tables completely turn uh, depending on uh, either GM, Gedley, or uh, harmonic distortion. So that's just something that I'm going to continue to test uh, with in the future is looking at the GM distortion, which I think it might uh, bring to light uh, some other um, interesting results. Okay, uh, so polar map, I'm just going to skip down here. This is the polar map, which shows extremely well-behaved off-axis that's wide and controlled. Uh, we're getting control down to about 500 hertz. And then um, there's a little bit of a, a widening there at 7 kilohertz. And then it stays consistently wide into the upper treble. And so we're getting an 80 degree listening window at 15 kilohertz. And so this is on par with, for example, a 25 millimeter dome tweeter. Um, and then in particular, we're getting a very wide and controlled through the mid range, which we'll talk about in a second. You can see here, this is the overlay with the 0, 15, 30, and 45 degrees off axis. And so if we look at what happens just 15 degrees off axis, you can see here that the peaks that we saw earlier are completely gone. So just by moving slightly off axis, we are able to eliminate those peaks that we saw. So we're getting actually a pretty decent frequency response that's about plus or minus 3 dB um, across its bandwidth. And then you'll also note too that we have extension um, right up to 20 kilohertz 
um, when looking at the 15 degrees off axis. So it's not like it's providing upper treble as like a laser beam, it's still wide uh, even into the upper treble. So that pays dividends for the overall spaciousness and clarity or um, perception of ambience and that. And you don't have to have your kind of head in a vice type situation. So, um, so my overall listening impre impressions on this. So this, this stood out in a number of areas and then didn't do quite as good in some others and so I'll, I'll explain that so we had a uh, tremendous soundstage depth at 9 out of 10 and so I believe that's uh, by virtue of the flat phase response the overall clarity with it being a coherent point source um, soundstage width was 9 out of 10 these things project wide soundstage um, you can tell there by the the polar map uh, that we're getting very even and wide off-axis coverage so that pays dividends in the soundstage width so smoothness like you saw there the frequency response extension almost reaches 30 kilohertz and so that little dust cap is providing great upper treble smoothness and i didn't find that the cone breakup that we saw in the time domain didn't have a detrimental effect to the overall smoothness so um, very excellent result there and was quite surprising considering that this is a full range driver um, most often full range drivers suffer with smoothness in the upper treble um, which i did not find with this driver at all so coherency between the mid-range and treble, 9 out of 10, um, being a point source again, um, that's what we're seeing. So as far as having to make trade-offs, uh, the coherency between the mid-base and the mid-range, um, this is something that we've made a very intentional design choice to create a large, shallow horn that doesn't have the close driver spacing that you see with so many designs, but we've made an intentional decision to focus on the step response, to focus on overall clarity through the vocal range, um, perhaps at the expense of the coherency between the mid bass and the mid range. And so that if there ever was a, a limitation in this design, that would be it. Uh, female vocal clarity, 10 out of 10. So Fostex has always been known for having great female vocals, very lively, and, and this is no exception. In fact, the, the uh, short uh, waveguide really takes it a step further in that it prevents the driver from sounding small. It projects a much larger sense of scale to the overall uh, uh, character. So um, musical timber accuracy, 9 out of 10. Again, going back to the polar map, you see a very well uh, power distribution into the room. And so you don't have an overemphasis on any particular part of the frequency band. So musical instruments come across sounding proper. And I would say best way to describe it is mature. It comes across uh, sounding just proper and mature uh, with, with uh, being able to render and auth authenticity to, to instruments. Uh, sense of dynamic range, 8 out of 10. It being a small 3-inch driver, 8 out of 10, still pretty good. It's not going to have the dynamics of a compression driver, uh, but we're making a trade-off in those other areas like we saw earlier. Okay, um, just to wrap it up, uh, Shallowhorn 1928, uh, new design. And so if you're interested uh, in something like this, please reach out to me. But for now, take care and have a great day.